eliminating poverty, like LBJ uh, said in relation to um, you know the the urban project, which was of course very strongly related to issues of racial equality. Or Kennedy says in relation to putting a man on the moon. And we can think of so many different projects. I mean, they just pick these pick pick these out. So I do ex ex accept a point that secularists emphasise, which is that there are limits to what we can hope for from the state. For example, religious truth can't come from the state or politics, as John Locke you know, pointed out. But no more than scientific truth can come from politics, or indeed art, or healthy living. But that does not mean that the state cannot promote religion any more than it means that the state cannot fund science or art or health. Of course, it funds these things, and most of us vote for parties that are committed to funding these things and possibly extending the funding. So it's true that the state cannot require any citizen to believe in the truth of any religious doctrine, but no more can it require a belief in any comprehensive or political doctrine. The state may fund science at universities, it may um, fund, you know, like DNA and, uh, well, so much different science. But just as it can do that, it can fund church-run schools without requiring any citizens to believe any particular doctrine. Just as the state doesn't have a view about scientific hypotheses. So when uh, Francis Crick, you know, working in a state-funded laboratory at Cambridge University, the Rutherford Laboratories, discovered the N uh, DNA and so on. The state, you know, <coughs> in due course, put more money in and so on, and obviously the whole thing's expanded. But nobody said, ah, the British state is now committed to this scientific theory. Everybody has to believe it, because if you don't, you may go to prison. So the state can promote religion without saying you must believe in something. It's up to you what you believe, but we're doing this, and we're doing this because there is a good reason which can be justified within liberal democratic constitutionalism. We're not in breach of liberal democratic constitutionalism when we fund science, so why should we be in breach when we fund religion or, or art or, or all the other things that states do fund? So it sounds like I'm saying that it is consistent with liberal democratic constitutionalism or what others may choose to call the liberal neutral state, that it's consistent with it to privilege religion. Yes, a kind of privileging of religion is permissible. For example, a state may fund church schools teaching the national curriculum, but not schools organized around atheism or race. In Britain, it would be unlawful to fund a school and say, the only people who can go to this school are black people. This is a black school. That would be unlawful, but it's not unlawful to fund a school and you say the only people that can go to the school are, are, are pupils selected by the Catholic Church organization, you know, their hierarchy, their selection process, or whatever. So there's clearly a privileging of one kind of school based on religion and a disprivileging of another kind of school school based on race. So yes, there is privilege. Such funding is a kind of privileging of religion, but, and this is an important argument for me, but in a multiplex way. Have I got that written up there somewhere? Yes, so that's where we now look. In a multiplex way. Multiplex is a word that conjoins multiple and complex. The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as involving or consisting of many elements in a complex relationship. I believe that the state typically engages in not merely multiple cases of privileging, but moreover that the privileging are not all of one kind. So there are different ways that we privilege. So the way that we privilege sport, as in the Olympics, is, is different to how we might privilege religion, which is different to how we might privilege the motor car industry, which is different to how we might privilege opera, and, and so on. So there's not one way that we privilege, but we do privilege in, a multiple, in multiple ways. The state may legitimately choose to give funding and prestige to banking, well, we know about that, to opera, 
to the Olympics, and to blue sky scientific research, but without using the same arguments or the same metrics of calculation. So similarly, with the funding and bestowing of prestige on faith schools within a state's regulated system of schooling. The liberal democratic state, then, may recognize that religion is special and may honor and support it in special ways, but this is not necessarily equivalent to simple privileging. So you could say that there's a multiplex privileging or a multiplexity of privileging and that there's no special or unique privileging of religion. So I do want to say that, that there's no special or unique privileging of religion. In fact, I think what it shows, what I believe my argument shows, is that the concept of neutrality is not very helpful over and beyond a requirement to not subtract from the liberal democratic constitutions. So far, I hope I've shown that the privileging of religion is in principle consistent with liberal democratic constitutionalism. This leaves unresolved many questions about uh, what shape this privileging should take. I can't resolve them, but I'd like to identify them and offer a couple of comments. Actually, I don't think I can do that. Are you writing that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I was going to identify them and offer a couple of comments, but maybe I'll leave that for discussion. Um, but what I will do uh, for the last five minutes then is to say something about the second objection. Remember I said there was a principled objection, that's neutrality, and there's a pragmatic political objection. Uh, I'll just close this part, which partly relates to this, but I'm, I'm not going to go into it unless you ask me in question time. So ask me, what did you mean by equalizing up this? <laughs> I just want to say that, that this privileging issue, I mean, there are at least three different issues about privileging. It's not one issue. So there's religion relative to non-religion. There is religion relative to no religion. And there is one religion relative to another religion or other religions. So, you know, it's got to be quite complexly unpacked. It's not a single question about is religion being privileged or not. And I, I don't say I've worked all that out. I had a little bit to say about it, but I'm going to leave that aside and turn to the, the second and final argument. And this is the argument to do with alienation. Rajiv Bhargava has argued that what I call moderate secularism is irretrievably flawed. And while it has accommodated Christians, it will not be able to accommodate Muslims. While Bhargava's view, which of course is pretty decisive for me, given that I want to accommodate Muslims, so you know, I must deal with this argument head on, because he's saying, hey, this won't work. While Bhargava's view of the irretrievably flawed, that's his term, irretrievably flawed nature of European secularism or church-state relations is based on a contrast with India, others take a similar view by comparing Western Europe to the United States. Kimlicker, for example, has argued that, I quote, American denominationalism has been successful pr precisely in relation to religious groups composed primarily of recent immigrants and Muslims in particular, who are more likely than European Muslims to express the feeling that their religion and religious freedoms are fully respected and that they are accepted as citizens. Similarly, it has been said of the US, in explicit contrast to certain European countries like Britain, that I quote, this is a quote from a very nice article actually by Nancy Foner and Richard Alba in IMJ, International Migration Journal of uh, 2008. Have a look at it if you don't know it. Anyway, this is a quote. Without the separation of church and state, we believe, they say, we believe the religions imported by past immigration streams could not have achieved parity with Protestant versions of Christianity. The claim that weak establishment or moderate secularism of Britain alienates the majority of Muslims, because that is the claim, alienates the majority of Muslims, is of course an empirical claim. And as such, it ignores the evidence about the strong sense of British identification and national pride amongst Muslims. And I've got actually you know, some empirical data um, about how Muslims are actually more likely to identify with Britain. 
and to express more confidence in British institutions than, than non-Muslims. And this is not one survey. This has been found across a number of different surveys at different points in time using different methodologies and so on. But um, just take my word for that. But of course, ask me if you want to know the references later. And of course, we know that British Muslims include many vociferous political groups. And between them, they've mounted many arguments, not to mention campaigns, in relation to socioeconomic deprivation, religious discrimination, incitement to religious hatred, various foreign policies, anti-terrorist policies, and so on. Yet there's no record of any criticism by a Muslim group in relation to establishment, you know, the Anglican establishment. On the other hand, many Muslims complain that Britain is too unreligious and anti-religious, too hedonistic, consumerist, materialist, and so on. Muslims protest much more secularist bans on modest female dress, such as the head scarf, head scarf and the face veil, than they do about establishment or Christian privileges. When in Christmas 2011, David Cameron, Prime Minister, said we should assert that Britain is a Christian country, first time a British Prime Minister had spoken like that for a very long time. It was welcomed by Ibrahim Mogra, the chairman of the Mosque Committee of the Muslim Council of Britain, which is the single most representative body in Britain, though I'm not saying it is the representative body. Which does indeed suggest that the difficulty that Britain has of integrating Muslims is more to do with what Jose Casanova himself identifies as the more important factor, namely what he calls recent trends towards drastic uh, secularization. Hence, if the US is better at integrating post-immigration religious minorities, it may not be to do with its non-establishment, but the greater presence of religion, and in particular, the greater social status of religion and its closeness to the mainstream of society, a point recognized by Casanova and offered as a factor by Foner and Alba. In this respect, it is important to note that while the US may be more of a secular state than Britain, the latter is more of a secular society and has a much more secularist political culture. That there shall be no establishment constitutional clause may work well for the US in certain respect, but it's far from stress-free, as we've seen with the rise of an embittered Christian right, including its support for aggressive foreign policies and Islamophobic politics as extreme as those in Europe and more conspicuously led by Christians. Indeed, the US Tea Party has forged links with Islamophobic groups such as the English Defense League and some of its luminaries are a source of nourishment for the mass murderer Anders Rejic, you know, from Oslo and Astoria. In short, the disestablishmentarian's argument that contemporary Christian state religion connections alienate groups such as Muslims is based on certain secularist assumptions, not evidence. If I'm right in suggesting that Muslims and other religious minorities are seeking equality through leveling up, not leveling down, <coughs> that relates to the phrase I didn't go into by equalizing upwards. Accommodation, meaning accommodation within something resembling the status quo in Europe, not a dispossession of Christian churches, then what we have is an additive, not a subtractive view of inclusivity. Typically, recognition or accommodation implies making a particular social dimension more, not less, politically significant, more explicitness and formality. Typically, equality movements do not seek less political importance for their organizing social categories. This is the case with race, gender, minority nationalities, sexual orientation, class, and so on. It is difficult to see why religion is to be treated differently. Hence, the challenge is not how to de-Christianize Western states, but how to appropriately add the new faiths alongside the older ones. So my conclusion is that multicultural equality requires some kind of public multifaithism in a state religion connection way. In relation to Britain, for example, 
It does not have to be within an Anglican establishment. 